Hi, everybody. Wow. This is, this is so well lit. So uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Pini Aquel. I'm the founder and CEO of Optimo. For those of you I haven't met, it's really exciting to be here. I always tell my wife that it kind of like feels like another wedding for me. Uh, and it's very tiring to have like your fifth and sixth and seventh wedding. So, but I'm getting used to it. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about your future as a marketer. So it's going to be a lot of like new stuff, predictions, how the future is going to look like. Uh, you know, hint, hint, it's going to be about positionless, as you can see in the title of the session. And, uh, but firstly, before I kick off, I want to really thank the Optimove team, uh, spearheaded by Ronnie Vexelman and his amazing team, the designers, the producers, everybody put this together. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And you know, for me, for me as the founder and CEO, I actually did nothing. I just showed up just like you guys. So, uh, and probably signed a check somewhere. But uh, other than that, it's really great to have such a team. So, so exciting how they pulled this thing together. I think really world class. So uh, high class, very cool. So, okay, so let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, your future as a marketer. So I'm gonna, short, I'm gonna share some personal stories as well. So it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be very engaging. So let's get going. Right, so basketball, right? Basketball is going to be a main theme of our session today. And I've always loved basketball. I'm a, I'm a huge basketball buff. This is, you know, the iconic Michael Jordan. And for those of you who don't know basketball or are not really into basketball, don't worry. I'll still make sure that you understand everything. It's not, you don't have to know the game really deeply. So I'll make it entertaining and fun. So Michael Jordan, you know, probably the greatest of all times. It's deb people debated, but most people think he is an iconic figure. And this is when I was uh, at, the, at the 12th grade. I was 18. That was 1996. This was like the peak of Jordan. I would wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning to see games. Uh, that was like in Israel, it's 4 a.m. when the games are, are running in the U.S. I was a huge, huge lover of basketball. But then when, and I obviously idolized Michael Jordan. Then when I was, uh, you know, finished high school, I lost interest. And I lost interest for about 24 years. You'll be surprised. I, I mean, throughout the Kobe era and the LeBron era, I didn't watch anything. I knew it's there, but I didn't watch it. And then this documentary, The Last Dance, is what pulled me back. That was 2020 when COVID hit, uh, 24 years later. later. And I wa it's an amazing documentary, by the way, if you haven't watched it. No matter if you like basketball or you don't like basketball, it's about the last year of Michael Jordan with the Chicago Bulls. An amazing, well-done documentary. Everything this guy does is amazing. Also this. So I watched this documentary. It pulls me back. And not only that it pulls me back, I'm starting to basically watch all the commentator shows. So I'm doing, uh, you know, first things first and first take and undisputed. And I know all the commentators and I get in love with the debate form and how they, how they you know, make an argument and persuade one another because, you know, we, it's part of the thing that I'm, we're doing here in Optimus. So it's really interesting for me how they're using data, trying to persuade one another. I'm watching the games. But when I'm watching the games 24 years later, what I'm realizing is that this game has really changed. It's not the same game that, I, game that I used to watch when I was 18. Why? The rules are exactly the same. So the game has changed, but let me, let me explain to you a little bit how basketball was traditionally played. There's basically five players, and they have five distinct positions, right? You have the point guard, the shooting guard, the small forward, the power forward, and the center. And usually they're organized by height, right? So the point guard is going to be the shortest guy. The center is going to be the tallest guy. And they have very distinct positions. So the point guard is kind of like the floor general, right? They need to, to distribute the ball, make sure other people get chances of scoring, uh, facilitate for other people. The, the, that person is the floor general, right? And the center needs to be beneath the basket, right? Grabbing rebounds because the tallest, right? Uh, rim protect, uh, shoot very close to the basket. You don't have to dribble a lot. You just need to be with like play position, right? you need to play with your back to the basket, things like that. And that's how coaches would teach players to play. But I saw that the game has changed and the game essentially became positionless. And we're going to break it down. What does that mean? So positionless basketball highlights versatility, fast play, de-emphasizing traditional roles. So this is Yanis uh, Antetokounmpo. We have a few Greek friends over here in the crowd. Yanis is, is an amazing sports figure. I don't know if you know him or not. But the reason Yanis is here, because he epitomizes the notion of positionless. 
Yanni Santetokounmpo is seven feet tall or 2.13 centimeters, very, very tall, typically a size of a center. But Yanis can, take, can grab a rebound on one side and run court to court, dribble the ball like a guard, and dunk on your face on the other side without passing the ball. This was never done before, right? Yanis dribbles. Yanis' uh, is, 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 uh, windspan is so long that like, if he gets close to the, to the free throw line, he can dunk on you because his arms are so long. So you take, you take a, a person like that, of that height, he's an amazing athlete, right? I think zero fat percent in his body, super strong, uh, really amazing. And then when you equip a guy like that with guard-like skills, with ball handling skills, what do you get? So what's his nickname, do, do, do you guys know? Anybody, Yanis' nickname? The Greek freak. Why is he the, number one, because he's Greek. But uh, the freak, because it's a freak athlete, right? We've never seen something like that. We've never seen a person that is this tall, this strong, and have those skills, right? So what's, what's happening here? So why is it happening, right? So let's break it down. There's three main reasons why the game became positionless, right? And, and I'll unpack it more. So first thing is data, right? People in basketball have been studying data, statistics, and uh, they found basically a, a way to hack the game. So the game is essentially flawed in the way the rules are built. You get three points for shooting beyond the arc, right? So if you shoot over there beyond the arc, you get three points, and you get two points if it's inside. And what they figured out is, wait a second, if two points, if, if I'm hitting two points at 50% probability, the expected value is going to be I'm going to get one point. But if I'm shooting three points at 33% probability, I'm also going to get one point. So if I'm going to shoot three points at 34%, maybe it's better to shoot threes. And the person who led that charge was a, a general manager called Daryl Morey at the time with the Houston Rockets, now with the, with the 76ers. And he was obsessed with statistics and efficiency. So you can see in this chart something really cool that the, in, in the year 2000, 2001, 2002, these are the, the the main 200 places within the court that shots are being taken. It's like a heat map. And on the right is 20 years later, in 2020, where shots are being taken. You're seeing that basically the game has completely changed. We're either shooting a three or we're shooting a very high percentage two-point shot, very close to the basket. So it has to be either very close to the basket or a three-point because we're playing the game of expected value, of statistics. And they also call it the death of the mid-range, right? So in, nobody's shooting, although Kawhi Leonard and DeMar DeRozan, there's a few players that do shoot the mid-range. It's not completely, but if you look at if the statistics overall, Coaches and GMs and people in basketball are pushing players to play like this because of the data. And now players need to adapt. They need to change. Everybody needs to shoot three-pointers. Uh, you know, a lot of lobs, a lot of things like that. So the game is changing also because of data and statistics and how they studied it. Second reason, why is the game becoming positionless? It's becoming positionless because young kids, young players, this is, I'll get to this guy in a second, young players, watching their idols growing up, they want to be like them, right? So I'm, I'm watching, I'm, I'm now, I'm not, but this is Victor Wembanyama. Victor is a French player. Uh, he is uh, 2.24 centimeters or 20, it's debatable. People say it's more than he lied about his height. He's seven, seven feet, four inches. He's a monster, he's 19, but he's like a huge giraffe, but with crazy, crazy skills. He shoots threes. He ball handles, he dribbles, he, he goes like behind his back. He's doing things, he, of course he's got five blocks a game because he's a monster and he's so tall. He's, it's insane. He's the greatest prospect in basketball since LeBron James. Everybody, and he's, he's living up to the hype so far. It's his first season, just watch videos of him on YouTube. It's insane. This guy, by the way, next to him, uh, he's uh, six, seven. <laughs> He's six seven, so and you can see Victor. He's dribbling, you know, very far from the basket. That's that, that's the logo over there, right? So uh, Victor, growing up, he doesn't want to be, you know, beneath the beneath the basket, you know, playing with his back to the basket. His coach tells him, all you need to do is dribble twice, go like this, you know, don't shoot the threes, don't learn how to dribble, don't do fun stuff, just do the boring stuff of a center. No, he watches Kevin Durant. He watches obviously Michael Jordan, LeBron James. He wants to be bigger than that. So that has changed the game a lot. Media, right? Kids consume it. Of course, when he was 12, he was probably already 6'6", but still, that's what he wanted to practice. Third reason, probably the biggest reason, everybody knows this guy. 
He's Steph Curry, Stephen Curry. Stephen Curry has really changed the game. He's probably the biggest reason why the game has changed. And when people debate who's like the greatest point guard, although he's not a classic point guard, they debate him versus Magic Johnson. They say that it's probably Magic Johnson. But the argument for Steph is that Steph is essentially the person who changed the game. Everybody's shooting threes because of Steph. Steph is the most popular player on the NBA. You know how we know, well, how we measure it. How do you know if somebody is the most popular? Jersey sales, exactly. So kids buy jerseys that say, the back of it says the name of the player with the Golden State in this case. He's number one in jersey sales by far. Uh, he's the most popular player. And the reason is he's giving hope for every kid. He's 6'2", he's not that tall. Uh, you know, not a lot of people can be 6'7", not a lot of people can have muscles like LeBron James, but every kid can shoot. So he showed everybody that if you shoot, you can be a superstar. Uh, ridiculous shots that in the past were considered to be ridiculous. A shot from close to the logo, very far away from the basket, or with a player where, that they have their hand here. You wouldn't make these shots. If you make a shot like that, the coach would put you on the bench because that's a stupid shot. He makes all stupid shots look real because he makes them. And then everybody's doing the same thing. Completely changed the game. Okay. Now, we understand that basketball is positionless, right? Uh, Giannis can run court to court. Uh, Steph is a point guard, but he doesn't pass a lot. He mostly shoots. Uh, Victor, we talked about that. So the game has changed. They're no longer playing the typical positions. They have roles. The roles are based on their traits. I could be a three and D guy. It means I'm shooting threes and I'm good at defense. Another person is a rim protector and a three-point shooter. It's all mixing up, right? What can we understand from this? This is a tectonic shift in basketball. What can we learn from this? So I'm trying to take basketball and bring it to marketing, right? And essentially, these are two of my loves. So this is why you see me here so excited. Like, uh, I love basketball, and I love, obviously, what we do in Optimove. So uh, the link between sports and marketing, basically, in both, we want adaptability and vers versatility to be key success factors. And I'm going to talk about AI a lot. Uh, this picture, you probably can imagine that I didn't ask our design team to produce. I, uh, I, uh, I'll tell you what I did here because it's important for me. I basically prepared my presentation for Connect and I uploaded the presentation into ChatGPT and I was like, hey, what do you think I can do better? And ChatGPT said, hey, you're actually missing a link slide between this and that. So you should call it the link between sports and marketing and then you should, pro and then you should do a picture of half a basketball court and half a marketing boardroom. And then he gave me the prompt. I went to Dal E. I put the prompt, make an image of half a basketball court, half a boardroom, and I got this, right? Uh, so no design help. Uh, this is basically, and this is pretty cool. Not all of them are cool, obviously. So what can we learn from, from basketball to marketing? So let's pause for a second and look at the biggest trends in tech. So obviously, I gave you a hint right now. It's, it's AI, right? You don't need me, me for that. Uh, so what happened in the last 18 months? In the last 18 months, we're seeing Gen AI surge. Specifically, we're seeing ChatGPT right, being widely adopted. I'm sure, who's using here ChatGPT? Raise your hand. Great, wow, it's 95%, I would say. Okay, so 95% are using ChatGPT uh, version four, but who's paying for ChatGPT? Who's paying? I, I am, right, but okay, so less, less so. So by the way, to upload, your, uh, to upload your, your presentation or an Excel file and have it analyzed, it, you need to pay. But never mind. So here what I did, this is actually a cool image. I asked Dal E to do an image of a large language model, <laughs> right? So this is basically ChatGPT painting himself. It's a self-portrait of a large language model, which I think is pretty cool, uh, you know, like an endless library, like an ancient library, and, and like this, I don't know, savant slash oracle that looks like Buddha or something. Uh, so those things are happening, and what do they do to us, right? They basically enhance us, right? Uh, if I'm a really good communicator, but I, I'm not a great writer because I don't have the patience to do to do it and edit myself 5,000 times again and again and again. And also English is not my first language. And this and this and this and that. All of a sudden, I got like an Iron Suit, an Iron Man suit. I can now, you know, I can write, like with the best of them. 
So I can just put my mind up, my mind dump for ChatGPT, and then it's going to organize it, and I can go back and forth with the prompts. So I got, I'm, I'm being enhanced, right? AI is essentially enhancing all of us. So what will that do, right? What will AI do, or is it already doing to marketing? So I have a prediction. It's basically in the title of the presentation. Uh, so I'm kind of like uh, ruining the, the surprise. So basically, it's going to create the positionless marketer. Just like we have players in basketball that are positionless, right? They no longer have distinct roles that only does one thing. They can do multiple things. This is the positionless marketer. And again, this, uh, a lot of the pictures, I've, I've just used DAL-E because I think it's a part of this, this session altogether. So this is another picture of the position. And I just said, make an image of the positionless marketer. That's what I got. Cool. So the positionless marketer, let's break it down a little bit. What does that mean for you guys? So if you look traditionally, uh, marketing, and, and I'm not want to go into the, to the question of whether I, I've created the right functions of marketing or the right personas of positionless. I'm just, I'm just trying to illustrate a concept, right? So don't, don't judge me on the specific things. It's not the point. So let's, you know, in the old world, right, you have a, a content specialist, right? Somebody writing blogs or, or, create, or writing copy or doing something like that. You have an operations specialist, right? Somebody project managing, a, you know, making, coordinating different things, organizing things within the department. We have a data engineer or data scientist or a data analyst in marketing, analyzing data, doing performance marketing, optimization. That's their superpower, right? And we have a design person, right, doing our designs and our banners and our visual, uh, visual aesthetics and everything goes with that. It's very distinct. And if I want to produce a campaign, if I want to do something, I need to go through all four stations, right? I say, hey, design, I need this and this and this. Uh, hey, data, I need, I need you to crunch the data. Give me a segment. Hey, right, I need to go through the steps. And we all know what happens when you do that. It's slower. It takes more time. You, you got, you, there's a lot of problems with that approach. But that's the main approach because we have the human capabilities that we have, to, we have to silo them into those specific places. This will become to a person who's got, still you're gonna have a very strong trait of content, right? So my, my superpower is content, but now because I'm enhanced, I'm able to do some data and I'm able to do some design. So I'm now the aesthetic writer, right? I can do some design. I, I'm, I'm mainly writing, but I can design a little bit. I'm not gonna go to the studio all the time. Maybe now I'm going to them every other week. Now I'm gonna go every month or every two months because a lot, just like I did this presentation, you know, you can ask my designers. They haven't created any, they just helped me kind of like organize it, but I've generated, I've created all the images myself. In previous Optimum of Connects in 2019, they had to do all of it, right? How cool is that? They're so happy that they, they got less work, you know, uh, yeah. So uh, another one could be a, an ops person, like a project manager who's also data driven. So you got a project manager with skills of data. Right, so you got the data-driven project manager. You got a data person that is actually becoming good at content. So you got the data storyteller or a designer that can actually produce as well. So you got, you got a designer. So you see, you see my point, right? Why is this so cool, right? Why is this so important for us, this enhancement that we're getting from AI? What is it gonna do for us? So mostly it's gonna make us a lot more efficient. Another picture from Dali, I was like, give me something about efficiency. So it's like clockwork, you know, cogs, how it works, fine. So it's going to make us much, much more efficient. Why is it going to make us more efficient? Because all of a sudden, we're going to work in a fashion that's less of an assembly line. When we produce something, now we're not going to go station to station to station to station to station, and then at the end, get our campaign or our finished product. We're going to work in smaller teams. Because if you are a data storyteller and, and you are a, the aesthetic uh, writer, we, we, have less, we don't need as many people as we did in the past. So we become like an A-team. We become more uh, autonomous in the way we're producing. So if, instead of doing it with four departments, we can be self-sufficient within two departments. So it's a smaller team. What happens when it's a smaller team? It's faster. It's just faster. You don't have to go through all the departments and have somebody being away or sick or they're not at work now, they're on vacation. Now we have to wait two more weeks until John comes back, you know, things like that. So it's faster, you have smaller teams. Another thing is the communication is much, much, much better because I understand you, I get you. If I have dabbled with a little bit of design, when I communicate with our designer, 
although she says it's not true, but when I communicate with her, I understand how it's like to do her job because I'm doing it myself. And when I'm doing it myself, you, you know, I, like I get you, I understand your work. We communicate better. So again, it's more efficient, it's faster. So it's smaller teams that communicate better. And lastly, and this is a cool uh, term that we, we like to use, it unlocks our multi-potentiality. Multi-potentiality, we are more than one profession, right? We, we, as humans, we have a wide gamut of traits and capabilities and skills, but sometimes we're being pigeonholed to do one thing, right? But now, being enhanced, fine, I'm a designer, but I'm doing a lot of stuff, right? I'm doing a lot of different things. And I enjoy it, because what's more fun than actually, you know, expanding your reach, right? What's more fun than that? I can share with you that personally, as the founder of Optimove, my biggest joy of creation in the early days and still today is my ability to, to be exposed to, to so many different fields, right? So I, I talk to the engineers and they tell me about this new tech and I participate in the discussion about architecture and things like that. Then I go to design and we talk about aesthetics and, and colors and color schemes and you know grids and, and, then you, and then I write something and then you know, it's so exciting. That has been the biggest, like I think entrepreneurship in many ways, it's a positionless thing. You have to be positionless. You can't build a company otherwise, right? And now it's enhanced. Now it's being democratized. Optimove has always been about your multipotentiality. So it's not a new concept for us. By the way, another one from ChatGPT. You like this one? No. Some people like it. Some people say it's scary. I don't know. But... Yeah, so, now, so I said, hey, image of human multipotentiality. Boom, violin, science, and art, everything is together, great. So we have always been about your multipotentiality. Our product has, has always been a product that basically uh, makes you guys do more than what is traditionally done, right? And what do I mean by that? Um, since 2012, Optimum has been the platform for marketers who can do more than one position. So what do I mean? This has been, from the beginning, from the, we have empowered data-driven CRM marketers. So what you guys do with Optimove, it's not the same thing that people do in the market outside. Mostly what happens in the market, there's the marketing guy, they write a brief to a data team. Hey, data team, I want a segment of this and this and this and this and this and this and that. You send an email or you fill out a form. The data team then goes in and creates this thing for you and, and there's a back and forth. In Optimove, since 2012, our users go in, they talk to themselves. They, do, they, they create the segment, they do the research, and they continue. So you've eliminated one department. When you finish the campaign, when you run the campaign, you send it to an analyst team. Hey, dear analyst, can you please analyze the campaign for me? I want a result. I want to know what happened. Oh, they're not here. You get, you get one back, one is not coming back. The next one, you're getting the result in three weeks, so you're tired from it. You're not even going to look at it. At Optimove, since day one, since 2012, hands-on campaign analysis. So you, you build a segment for the campaign, you execute it, you still go through design, right? And then you analyze it. So we've been about that ourselves all the time, all these years. By the way, uh, here I try, I wouldn't use this picture, but I try to keep it real with, with the AI stuff. So, but you can see here also the faults. I'm saying, uh, you know, do something about campaign analysis and it's kind of, it's, it's cute. It's cute, I don't know. But I wanted to use it still, although it's, you know, it doesn't write the words correctly and things like that. More than ever, we will continue to be the place where marketers unlock their multi-potentiality. So now with Gen AI, we will continue to champion this approach of you guys doing more, right? Doing, being more autonomous, being faster, your speed of, from ideation to execution, everything's gonna be faster. So uh, this is, we, we, we want to be, we are the platform for the positionless CRM marketer. The prediction is about positionless, and we're going to beat that thing, right? And I'm going to finish off with basketball again to tie, tie together, right? So we, we start from basketball, we end with basketball. So this is LeBron James. LeBron James is very well known. I haven't used him in the beginning. I'm saving him, although I don't love LeBron James that much, but I do, uh, you know, obviously idolize him and appreciate him. He is the, the epitome. He's the epitome of positionless. You can see a stat here, LeBron James at the top, he's the all-time scoring 
champion, the all-time scoring, number one scorer in the history of the NBA. He just surpassed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar last year, which is fine. And you can see the list of people here that are the all-time scoring, right? So LeBron, Kareem, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Karl Malone. But then you have the list of the people who make the most assists, the people who pass the ball. Completely different people, right? Those, those lists are completely foreign to one another, right? They're mutually exclusive, except for one person, LeBron James. He's number four in the all-time assist list. So he scores and he passes. He does both things like, like nobody has ever done before, right? So your future is positionless, and it's your time to become a LeBron James of marketing.